Dan, you've been thinking about consciousness professionally for getting near half a century now. What have you learned during this period? I've learned first that some of my initial ideas I think were right on target, but that it's a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting than I thought when I wrote my, my first work on unconsciousness. So the core idea is that? The core idea is that consciousness is not a mysterious property or phenomenon that sunders the universe in <laughs> twain. It's, it's a complicated variety of different things and the model that we use, which is our own consciousness, which we understand from all the ways we interact and talk with each other about it, when we apply that to other creatures and robots and the like, we get in a lot of trouble because some of the features of our consciousness are just not features of the consciousness of other creatures. So should we call what they have consciousness? Well, that's a terminological dispute that is not worth answering. Let's get the features down, and once we've got a good theory of all the different varieties, then we can decide who owns the terms. <laughs> okay, so, so if that's the core, then what are some of these features that have enriched your understanding over these years? I think the most important change that I made from my earliest work was the recognition that what, what's happening in the brain is there are many competing streams of content running in competition and the, they're, they're fighting for influence or mm -hmm. fame mm -hmm. in the brain. Mm -hmm. And the one that temporarily wins, it's king of the mountain, that's what we can remember, what we can talk about, what we can report, and what plays a dominant role in, our, in guiding our behavior. That's, those are the contents of consciousness. But they're not distinguished from all the others by being transduced into some other medium <laughs> Uh, there's no place where it all comes together. There's just this competition for influence going on in the brain. Now that to me sounds like a tension as opposed to this subjective uh, quality of the sense that there's, a, there's this inner movie that we experience. Well, attention is very much at the heart of it, and, and rightly so. But attention can be diffuse or it can be very focused. And there's the things where, and that in itself, it's not like, just like a spotlight with things in it and things that are out of it. And some things that are not focused on, not attended, can nevertheless play big roles in, sure. in modulating our behavior. Uh, but what's, what's missing, you're saying, is the, the subjective feel or something, the qualia. Yeah, and, and one can imagine you, have, you can have a tension in a system, a biological system, yeah. without having the qualia. Well, what do you mean by the qualia? I think the idea of qualia is in the end broken back. It, we should just get rid of it. It means too many different things to too many different people. It's a philosophical term of art which has never been well defined. Uh, the trouble is that for many people, qualia are, if, if you like, by definition, intrinsic, non-functional <laughs> features of consciousness. Well, that just by definition, rules out any functionalistic decomposition of them. But in fact, you can do that. And there's some lovely examples now. I particularly admire David Huron's work in his uh, wonderful book, uh, Sweet Anticipation. It's a book about music. Right. He's a musicologist neuroscientist. And he takes the qualia of the scale tones, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, and he asks, dozens of people, including trained musician, musicians, just to free associate on what the qualia are that they associate with do, with re, uh -huh. with ti. And he writes down all the adjectives and metaphors that they, that they come up with. And then he does a careful statistical analysis of them and finds that they cluster and finds that he has a theory that explains how these are implemented in the brain. He's, he's got a decomposition and analysis of the intrinsic ineffable quality of the scale tones. Yeah. Well, if you can do that for scale tones, I mean, I think we do, musicians in particular will tell you that, that me and soul are, are, are really yeah. different. <laughs> and, it's not, and, and no matter what key you're playing in, they're different. And they say the difference is ineffable. Well, it's not ineffable. If you do the science, you can take those quality apart. Now, it's important to realize that when you do that, it's not the case that 
these neural features conspire to produce Shazam, this extra thing that Quale. No, it's that these neural features produce the reactions that go with me or soul or tea and the beliefs and the expectations and the and the 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 distastes or the loves all of these emotional affective reactions are engendered by these complex neural combinations that he's taken apart when we've got that done there's no room the qualia themselves are, there's no work for them to do is that an identity theory that says those complex neural relationships and firings all together uh, is that feeling is it an exact identity theory well the trouble with the term identity theory is that you don't have a good identity theory unless you've got crisp clean characterizations of the things to the left and the right of the equal sign okay and uh, the trouble is that the thing on the left side the qualia don't have a good clear definition so no matter what I put on the right hand side there's always going to be somebody who's got a different conception of qualia as well mm. I've got a counterexample of that given my understanding of qualia. Yeah. Well, of course you do, but so what? Maybe your maybe your concept of qualia is just is just not a good one, and there's a better one which which does justice to the phenomena. So I I, I think this is one case where the philosophers not just penchant but need for definitions stands in the way of getting clear. People end up spending all their time and energy hammering away on the definitions and the counterexamples instead of looking at the empirical work that you might do. That's profoundly subversive as a philosopher for me to say that, but that's what I've come to appreciate more and more over the years.